Hello. I get a lot of questions about how I made the buttons for this coat, so I thought I'd try making a video of it. I learned mostly from this booklet, which I bought from Burnley and Trowbridge. And Gina Barrett also has a video on it, which I will link somewhere. I'll start with just a plain one colored button, and then the two colored ones I used on my coat, and then the tiny little ones on this waistcoat, and then these six sectioned ones with four different colors. Death's head buttons are made of thread wrapped around a mold, which is usually made out of wood, bone, or horn. They were very popular in the 18th century on men's clothing, and to a lesser extent on women's. I don't know when exactly they first appeared, and there are a lot of different styles of thread buttons that came before them, but you see small ones made of metallic thread pretty early in the 18th century. By the middle of the century, they're frequently seen on coats and waistcoats, either matching or contrasting with the fabric. They're easy to spot in portraits because the light shining on the threads makes this neat little hourglass shape. In the 1780s and 90s, coat buttons got a lot bigger and more exciting. Stripes became very popular and so did multicolored buttons to match them. Some have four sections, some have six, and some even have eight. Little multicolored ones for waistcoats are also quite popular around this time. If you're wondering where the name Death's Head Button came from, the answer is, I don't know. As far as I'm aware, nobody knows. There's a theory that it may be because the X between the four sections resembles the crossbones in a skull and crossbones, but honestly I don't really see it. Which is perhaps why a while ago when I was talking to a friend about this, I completely misremembered and thought that it was because of the hourglass shape and how hourglasses appear next to skulls in so many Vanitas paintings, and sometimes on gravestones. And I still think this makes sense. I mean, this looks a lot more like an hourglass than the crossbones, so I guess that's my theory for now. But who knows? History is muddled and confusing and we can never know for sure because whoever came up with the name is too dead to tell us. Just like this muskrat. To make them you will need some sort of button mold. I got these ones from Burnley and Trowbridge, and there are a few other stores that sell them too. For bigger buttons, I use these wooden discs I got on Etsy. They just need a hole drilled through the middle. You can also drill a hole through plastic buttons and use those. Heavy thread or fine yarn. This is a very sturdy linen which I'll use for my six section button, and which is also good for tying off the threads at the back. Silk buttonhole twist is great if you can get it, but cotton pearl is a much more affordable and widely available option. Not historically accurate, but it looks nice enough. There are lots of threads that work, just try to avoid anything too thick or fuzzy, or made up of multiple strands like embroidery floss. Beeswax. I cut this off the end of a candle, but you can get it from sewing supply stores too. Just make sure it's real beeswax. A pencil or waterproof pen for marking out the sections. Small scraps of paper to make templates for marking out the sections. Possibly a small pair of pliers. Scissors or snips. One straight pin. A sharp needle and a blunt needle. And while not strictly necessary for buttons, it's always nice to have a thimble. First you need some kind of template to mark out the sections. I make mine by tracing and cutting out a circle of paper, folding it in half both ways, and cutting four evenly spaced notches. I then mark the sections onto the mold. Rub the lump of beeswax on the button mold until it has a thin coating all over. This makes it slightly sticky, which will help the threads stay in place. Before starting the decorative wraps, you need an X-shaped base to anchor them to. Holding the thread against the back of the mold, and leaving a little bit of a tail, make a few wraps around the mold one way, and then the other. I'm doing five here, but this differs depending on the size of the mold and the thickness of the thread. Using the tail end, I stitch around the middle of the X a few times and tie it off. This should be at the back, or the flatter side of the mold. At this point, I like to hold up my template again to make sure the four sections are even. With the long thread coming from the back, begin wrapping it so it catches on the ends of the anchoring X, like so. Between wraps, the thread should pass under the middle of the button, so on your next wrap you're wrapping towards your previous wrap, 
After your first four, you should have this nice little square, and you keep adding that to the inside of the square. After a while, it will become harder to keep the wraps from slipping, so to prevent this, we stab a straight pin through the back of the button, right in the middle. Now when you bring the thread around to the back, it will loop nicely around the pin. Continue wrapping until you've filled most of the button. It can be a bit tricky to get the tension right, but you'll improve with practice. Once your wraps start getting close to the middle, carefully pull back the pin so the tip is just below the threads. Do not pull the pin out or the whole button will fall apart. Keep wrapping until there are no gaps left. You'll probably have to nudge and squish the threads a bit so everything lies smoothly. Now you can cut off your thread, leaving a tail of about 15 centimeters. To secure the wraps, you'll need a strong wax thread. Here I'm using a heavy linen. I should have waxed it and threaded the needle before starting because it's best not to put the button down or risk the wraps coming loose. Using the blunt needle, pass the thread under one of the four clumps of wraps on the back of the button, leaving a tail of at least 5 centimeters. Pass it under a few more times, pulling tightly, and do the same for the other three. Once you get back to the first bunch, pass the needle under again once or twice. Now you can take the pin out. Here I like to tie off the threads in a square knot. The booklet says you don't need to tie it because the wax keeps it in place, but I like to anyways. Threading the tail of your main thread through the sharp needle, dab it through the back and bring it up right next to the middle and stitch a little X there to help secure the longest wraps. This might require pliers. Tie off the thread, cut it off, and it's finished.
sew them on, I like to use more of that heavy wax linen. If you're familiar with how to sew on 18th century cloth covered buttons, the process is pretty similar. I first secure my thread to my garment. Then stab through the bump on the back of the button. Take a stitch through the garment and repeat that a few more times. I'm not stitching it on too tightly. Next, you wrap the thread around a few times to form a shank and tie it off. In 18th century construction, the buttons are usually sewn on before the lining, but in the cases where it's not, you might want to be a bit more careful in tying it off neatly. Now for the black and white coat buttons. I'm first marking the exact middle of these one and a half inch wooden discs so I can drill the necessary holes, and then marking out the four sections. It starts off the same way as the one color button, with the waxing and the X-shaped anchoring threads. But unlike the first button, I'm doing the wraps two at a time. As far as I can tell, most of these big multicolored buttons have the wraps done at least two at a time, presumably because it helps them stay flat. When doing a button for a matched set, I periodically check it against a finished one to make sure all the sections are the right size. When it's time to change colors, I stitch the end of the thread under a few wraps at the back, stitch the new thread under a few times from the opposite side, and tie them in a square knot. <laughs> 
I continue wrapping the same as before, two at a time, checking to make sure I have the right amount of each color. When you get to the end, you might end up having to do a few more wraps in one direction than the other, but that's okay. It happened in the 18th century, too. Use your most uneven buttons for the least visible areas on your garment. I like to smooth out the button with my thumbs, just to make sure the threads are lying as nicely and evenly as I can get them. Just like the first button, I'm tying off the wraps with heavy wax linen, using my blunt needle to go underneath all of them and pulling fairly tightly. Some of these big decorative buttons don't have those little anchoring stitches in the middle, but I like to add them, especially since two of the buttons on this coat are functional. Next up are some little 12mm buttons I'm making for a waistcoat. I find it's best to wax all the molds at once before starting, otherwise I'm likely to forget a few. <laughs> 
Since these molds are so small, I don't bother marking out the sections. I do it by eye. I threaded the needle for tying off the middle of the X before I started wrapping, because on the first two attempts I didn't and it came loose and I had to start over again. Sticking the pin in before doing the wrap seemed like a good idea, since the small buttons are much harder to control. We're back to doing the wraps one at a time for this one. I tied the second color on but didn't cut off the first one, since I will be switching back to it after just two rounds of contrasting wraps. I suggest practicing on bigger buttons before trying one this size, because they're trickier and they make your hands hurt. I tried to do the little securing stitches in the middle, but the hole in the molds was too small, so I just hope they don't snag or wear out too quickly. 
Because these ones are so strenuous on the hands, I highly recommend taking breaks between them. Go stretch and work on something that uses different muscles. Please don't give yourself horrible hand cramps. Here's my unfinished waistcoat front. and I'm sewing the buttons on just like before, taking little stitches through the fabric and stabbing through the bump, then wrapping around it to make a thread shank. When sewing on buttons close together, you don't need to cut your thread in between them. Just be sure to anchor it with a few stitches when you start the next one, so it doesn't bunch up the front when you pull on it. This will all be covered by the lining later. These last ones are for a coat I haven't even cut out yet, but as long as you have the fabric and know how many you need, it's never too early to make buttons. For the template I folded the paper in half, and then into thirds to mark out six sections. The process for these is pretty much the same as the black and white ones, but working in hexagon instead of a square. I did a few practice buttons to work out the color sections on these, but now I realize it would have been better to make a sketch. <laughs> 
that's all the buttons I have to show to you today. I hope I've done a good enough job of explaining the techniques. With them, you should be able to make buttons in any colors you want. Like all things, it takes practice. But if you finish a button and it's horrible, you can simply cut off the threads and start over. Or carefully unwind and save them, if they're expensive. I hope this video was helpful, or at least interesting, and I hope that maybe it's inspired you to make some buttons. I've written an accompanying blog post with more examples of original 18th century buttons, which I will link to in the description.